major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, proud to support the mission of KPBS and privileged to serve San Diego clients. Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, helping homeowners maintain drain, heating and cooling systems since 1978. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. by viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening, it's Tuesday, May 25th. Thank you for joining us, I'm Maya Trabulsi. One year ago today, George Floyd was killed by former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin. The solemn day is being recognized around the country, including right here in San Diego. And KPBS reporter John Carroll is live outside the County Administration Building, where a very special guest will soon lead a memorial. John. Maya, a memorial gathering is scheduled to start at six here, and the guest of honor who will help lead that event is Gary Jones. He is George Floyd's first cousin. He's a sailor that serves aboard the USS Roosevelt right now. Now, after sunset, the county building here will be bathed in blue and green light. Those are the colors of Minnesota, I learned today. Also, Balboa Park buildings, they will be swathed in that light as well. But people did gather around San Diego earlier today to mark the occasion. We are here for the one year anniversary of George Floyd. A handful of people gathered in front of the Hall of Justice downtown today to mark the passage of a year since George Floyd was murdered at the hands of Derek Chauvin. The small turnout bringing a sad acknowledgement from one of the speakers. A year later, and look, look around you. It looks like business as usual. But for those involved in the struggle who are determined to see a more just system of policing in America, it's anything but business as usual. Yousef Miller is with the Racial Justice Coalition of San Diego. We cannot slow down or relax on this mission. This mission is a global mission. We are supported by the rest of the planet, and we want to make sure that black and brown people have equity and justice in this nation. People have spoken up. All races have come together. People the Reverend Shane Harris leads the People's Association of Justice Advocates. His group is organizing tonight's memorial. He says he's optimistic about the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act passing before the end of the year. We're very excited about uh, what they are working on, and I, I believe that when this bill gets to the president's desk, it will be robust. It will create innovative changes uh, to policing in America. Now, we are going to stay here for the memorial, and we will be, I'm hoping, hearing from Mr. Jones, and we will bring you that part of the story tomorrow morning on KPBS-FM on Morning Edition. Live along the Embarcadero, John Carroll, KPBS News. Maya? Thanks, John. And calls for police reform have led to change here in San Diego, but not fast enough for some activists. Coming up, a look at the progress and what is still in the works. Activists gathered around San Diego City Hall today to protest the city budget proposed by Mayor Todd Gloria that would increase funding for police. KPBS reporter Joe Hong spoke to protesters about where that money should go instead. Who's budget? Our budget. Community leaders from across San Diego spoke out against Gloria's proposal to increase the police department's budget by $19 million. John Wee Tran is an organizer with the Center on Policy Initiatives based in San Diego. When the new mayor, um, when Mayor Gloria ran for his campaign with the slogan, Mayor for All of Us, and his budget does not reflect that it is for all of us. Almost exactly a year after the murder of George Floyd, activists like Tran are asking why this money isn't going towards addressing homelessness or building parks for low-income neighborhoods. We're advocating for at least $10 million reduction in police over time and shift the homeless, um, the, the police function that uh, respond to the homelessness um, out of the police department and to path who are better equipped. Janae Wall is a member of the San Diego chapter of the Alliance of Californians for Community Empowerment. She said more money should be going to dismantling the school to prison pipeline. Focus on youth service, children and youth services for them to succeed. Academically, creatively, 
whatever space they want to go into, we need to have those programs. In defense of his budget, Gloria said most of the increase is due to pension costs that are mandated by law. Also, supporters of the police have cited a jump in violent crime as justification for the increases. San Diego City Council members will present their amendments to the budget during a public meeting on Wednesday. The final budget will be approved by June. Joe Hong, KPBS News. San Diego County is spearheading efforts to help vaccinate workers in Baja, California. KPBS reporter Alexandra Rangel has more on the cross-border collaboration. At a time when vaccines are at a surplus in California, the county is making efforts to vaccinate 10,000 maquiladora workers from Tijuana. A line on a map does not stop our shared economy. A line on a map does not stop our shared culture and community. The County Board of Supervisors Chair Nathan Fletcher announced a new pilot project to vaccinate maquiladora employees at six United States subsidiary companies. Aside from the county's weekly vaccine allotment, the board was able to request 10,000 additional Johnson & Johnson vaccines from the state to be used for the vaccination efforts. With Mexico's vaccine rollout moving at a slower pace than California, Fletcher says it's the right thing to do. We have more vaccines that are being utilized and we are in a position as a state to be a good neighbor and a good partner. As of Tuesday, 68 percent of eligible San Diegans have received at least one dose of the vaccine. Meanwhile, the health department in Baja California is still working to vaccinate vulnerable populations and has struggled to provide second doses within the recommended time frame. Fletcher highlighted the importance of making sure Mexico, our biggest trading partner, has a healthy workforce. We also know that that border crossing, both in people but in goods and commerce, is vital to the economy of both of our countries and both of our regions. The Consul General of Mexico, Carlos Gutierrez, says the vaccine will be at no cost to workers. Vaccines are free. However, there is an administrative fee which is covered directly by the employers. No U.S. taxpayer money is being used for this initiative. UC San Diego Health will be vaccinating about 1,500 maquiladora workers each day at a mobile clinic site in San Isidro. Alexandra Rangel, KPBS News. A homecoming for sailors aboard the USS Theodore Roosevelt today. The aircraft carrier returned to San Diego following a six-month deployment across the Pacific. It left in December, the second deployment its crew embarked upon in 2020. There were plenty of hugs, kisses, and happy tears as families welcomed back their sailors, and some even meeting new additions for the very first time. Coming back getting older. It's crazy. I never thought this day would come for real. During the Roosevelt's first deployment, it was sidelined for months in Guam after a COVID-19 outbreak. More than 1,200 sailors were infected, about one quarter of the ship's crew. The federal government has allocated over $300 million in COVID relief funds to San Diego County. As KPBS reporter Melissa May explains, one county supervisor wants some of that money to go to those who help protect the county. This is an, uh, an offer to help them get back on their feet. Supervisor Jim Desmond wants to send $40 million of American Rescue Plan Act funding to first responders and military families. What these grants would offer is up to $6,000 or three months worth of back rent or back mortgages uh, uh, for these uh, military families and first responder families. Many military and first responder families have lost their jobs or have had to miss work to help take care of their children. Military veteran and spouse Rena Ryan describes her experience. My children's schools were immediately shut down. Our businesses reduced their hours, workers were sent home, and the shelves in the grocery stores were empty. She had to take care of her five children alone when her husband received orders to respond to the COVID outbreak on the USS Roosevelt. As I helped my family and my children adjust to this new life of social distancing and distance learning. It's, it's very important. They're the ones that are willing to put their lives on the lines for us. And, and, you know, they're the ones that, uh, you know, when a fire is burning, they don't run away from it, or they run to it. And so when we had this uh, COVID uh, experience, they're the ones that ran out ahead and tried to, you know, make it all safe for the rest of us. And so we owe them a, a bit of gratitude. Both Desmond and Supervisor Nathan Fletcher are military veterans. 
they're near and dear to our hearts and we and we understand the hardships that those families face and the fact that they have to pick up and move as often as they do and then when they do you know san diego is not a cheap place to live under desmond's proposal funds would be paid to the landlord or mortgage lender in the form of a grant by san diego county the proposal goes to the board of supervisors on june 8th melissa may kpbs news a COVID-19 wrongful death claim involving Donovan State Prison in Otay Mesa has been filed against the State Corrections Department. I know source investigative reporter Jill Castellano has the story. Leon Martinez was an inmate at Donovan Prison in San Diego when he died from COVID-19 in January. Now, his wife and three children are taking steps to sue the state for its role in his death. They say guards were not wearing masks or social distancing during a winter outbreak, and the prison was housing infected inmates with people who didn't have the virus, causing Martinez to contract COVID-19. Here's his wife, Evangelina Garcia. We felt like his life was disregarded, and a lot of other inmates' lives were disregarded while they were at Donovan and when they passed. The state has about six months to review the family's administrative claim. If it's rejected, they can file a lawsuit. Garcia says she wants to help other families who've lost incarcerated people to COVID-19 and to advocate for changes in the state prison system. So I hope that every guard there, warden that works at a prison respects the life of every inmate in that prison because every inmate there either has a mother, a father, a son, a daughter, a wife, you know, praying for them out here. The state corrections department would not answer questions about Martinez's death, but has defended its handling of the pandemic. 18 Donovan inmates and one staff member have died from COVID-19. For KPBS, I'm my news source investigative reporter, Jill Castellano. And that story was co-reported by Mary Plummer. I news source is an independently funded nonprofit partner of KPBS. George Floyd's death one year ago today sparked a global movement as people from all races took to the streets to call for greater racial justice and police reform. San Diego was no exception. Protests took place across the county with thousands calling for changes. So where are we now? I talked with KPBS race and equity reporter Christina Kim to find out where San Diego stands on police reform one year after George Floyd's death. Welcome, Christina. Hi, Maya. As I mentioned, this summer we saw a lot of calls for police reform, but what actually happened this past year? So right away in early June, the San Diego Police Department and Sheriff Department banned the use of carotid restraints, which is when police use pressure on both sides of a person's neck to subdue them. Later that month, the San Diego Police Department also changed their policy, making de-escalation a requirement and setting out more explicit measures for other officers to intervene if they saw their fellow officers using excessive force. But a lot of advocates for police reform saw these steps as too small. And in early July of last year, the Coalition for Police Accountability and Transparency, or CPAT, released a number of reforms that they wanted to see, which included cutting the police budget and creating an independent police oversight committee. As we know, that independent oversight is where we saw some actual movement this past year. And Measure B, of course, passed in November and establishes an independent investigatory oversight commission that we talked about. What is the status on that? That's right. It passed with nearly 75% of the vote, but it's May and we still don't have a commission up and running yet. It's been a slow process that's been a source of frustration for community members eager for change. I spoke with Andrea St. Julian who helped craft Measure B. She says she's hopeful, but a little concerned at how long it's taking to set up this commission. She also says it's very important to her to get new people, not just keep the existing commissioners from the previous community review board. There are a lot of these holdover commissioners who want to run the commission just in the same way as they ran the old board. They don't wanna make change. And they're trying to um, put in policies and procedures that are gonna keep the commission from moving forward. So community members are very upset about that. 
So what St. Julian is alluding to here is that just last week, the transition committee voted on whether or not the new commission should allow police officers to attend close deliberation when commissioners are reviewing cases. The committee ultimately voted to recommend that police should not be part of these closed sessions, but St. Julian thinks that the fact that it was even brought up is concerning. So while we're waiting for this change, is there any police oversight in place? Well, there are no new independent investigations, but we do have an interim commission that's reviewing case cases and still providing recommendations. In terms of getting that new commission up and running, meaning conducting independent investigations, the transition team estimates that will be early next year. We heard a lot about defunding the police over the summer. So where do we stand now with the mayor's proposed 2022 budget? The proposed San Diego police budget actually saw an increase in funding, which has really upset a lot of community members who have been calling in during the budget review meetings. Mayor Gloria increased the police budget by around $19 million for a total of nearly $600 million. In comparison, the Commission on Police Practices was allotted around $1.5 million. So beyond the Commission and police budgets, what are you keeping your eye on in terms of criminal justice reform? As we move forward, I'm keeping a look at three things. At the local level, I want to see what happens with Mayor Todd Gloria's proposed police reforms that are released in April, and in particular, what happens with efforts to limit pretextual stops, which studies have shown disproportionately impact Black and Latino people here in San Diego. At the state level, we saw a lot of police reforms peter out last year, but reform-minded Democrats are really wanting to push through certain bills like SB2, which would create a statewide licensing system for police officers. And finally, at the federal level, I think all eyes are on the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, which some were hoping would be on the president's desk by the anniversary of Floyd's death, but which is still stuck in the Senate. And of course, I think we just have to see how the reforms that have already been implemented are enforced. It's a lot to keep following in the next year. That's Christina Kim, KPBS race and equity reporter. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. The San Diego City Council today approved a 20-year contract that keeps SDG&E as the city's sole electricity and gas provider. KPBS Metro reporter Andrew Bowen says it was a contentious vote. Activists have been pressuring Mayor Todd Gloria to cut a shorter-term deal with SDG&E, which they say reaps massive profits while charging homes and businesses some of the highest energy rates in the country. The new agreement lets SDG&E continue to operate its equipment on city-owned land. In exchange, the utility will pay the city $80 million, plus another $30 million, for solar energy rebates and projects to adapt to climate change. The city can opt out of the deal after 10 years, but Councilmember Monica Montgomery Stepp said the city would have to pay back some of that money if it chooses that route. We would essentially, at 10 years, having be having to give up... Um, by my account, uh, close to $40 million to get out of this. Um, and, and so that's, for me, constructively, it makes it very, very hard uh, to justify and to really make those off-ramps uh, feasible. Councilmember Marnie Von Wilpert said the new contract is an improvement on the previous deal, and neither SDG&E nor the city got all that it wanted. But I appreciate the mayor pushed really hard to build transparency, compliance, and accountability into this tough negotiation. I see we're taking steps on that path. We have an audit for the first time ever. We have a citizens' oversight committee for the first time ever. So for these reasons, I think the mayor got a better deal the 2020 ITV under the previous administration, and I will be voting yes. The final council vote was six to three, with some minor last-minute changes. Among those, the city plans on conducting a feasibility study of taking over SDG&E's assets and forming a municipal utility. Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. For the most part, plenty of sunshine days to come. However, we'll see a little bit of a cooler weekend for some of you, mainly further inland into the higher terrain, but there is no rain in sight. Temperatures for tonight in the metro dropping off into the low 60s under plenty of clear skies out there, perhaps just a few passing clouds, but overall, it's a mainly clear night for us, getting down to 57 degrees over in Oceanside, 60 degrees in Chula Vista, El Cajun getting down to 60 degrees. Regal Springs.
springs and not even falling out of the 70s for those overnight lows. Wednesday, the warmth really begins to build in here again. So we'll see temperatures on the rise for some of you as we push into your Wednesday. But that does come at a cost and elevated fire danger once again. And perhaps a few morning clouds for some of the coastal regions here early in the morning. Tomorrow, temperatures getting back up into the upper 60s and low 70s near the coast. Ramona getting up to 82 degrees. Bragle Springs upper 90s in the forecast for you on your Wednesday. Thursday, not much of a change here between a Wednesday and Thursday. The warmth really does continue, but further inland, temperatures really heat up. We're talking about highs anywhere from 5 to 10 degrees warmer in and around the Four Corners region uh, for the later part of the work week. Near the coast, temperatures are not changing a whole lot here as we move through the next couple of days and head into the weekend. Highs in the upper 60s to low 70s basically every day. Further inland, you'll notice a little bit of a change here with temperatures peaking in the low 80s on Friday before dropping off into the mid 70s for your Saturday and Sunday. In the mountains, temperatures generally also not changing a whole lot here, but we could cool off a little bit from the mid 60s through the rest of the work week back down into the low 60s towards the end of the weekend. And in the desert, it is hot, hot, hot. The heat is on with temperatures staying in the upper 90s here through the end of the work week and heading into the weekend. For KPBS News, I'm meteorologist Jessica Pash. After four years or more and a global pandemic, graduation day has arrived for San Diego State University students. Commencement ceremony started today at Petco Park. Graduates only got four tickets to limit capacity inside the stadium and masks and social distancing were required. But that's not dampening the spirits of students who've waited years to celebrate this achievement. 2020 was a hot mess, but <laughs> we're here nonetheless, and I'm excited to be able to walk across the stage. I worked so hard for four years, so I might as well celebrate it. Students who graduated in 2020 were also getting the opportunity to participate in the in-person commencement ceremonies. Congratulations to all of them. KPBS arts reporter Beth Accomando is an avid Star Wars fan who enjoys celebrating May the 4th be with you. But she wanted to remind people that it was on May 25th in 1977 when Star Wars opened in theaters and changed the movie landscape forever. She spoke to fans who saw it opening day about their memories. Here is her video postcard. I remember the Fox fanfare. And when you're sitting in a single screen house with anywhere from 800 to 1,000 people with this massive wall-to-wall -wall screen, it's, it's pretty heady stuff. And then the blue that said, you know, a long time ago, we had a galaxy far, far away, and the screen went black. And then, bam! I was 13 years old when I saw Star Wars for the first time at the Valley Circle Theater on opening day, May 25th, 1977. We'd never seen a line for a movie, let alone one that wrapped all the way around the building. And then when we showed up, we were the first ones at the theater in San Diego on opening day. There were always lines. We were always waiting in line to the point where we had our own line sitting equipment. We would bring lawn chairs. We would bring decks of cards. We would bring other things to occupy ourselves with. It was very hard to get good photos of various costumes from various angles. So we would actually go and watch it with a sketch pad in hand and track a particular costume through through the whole movie and take sketches of it. The basic thing is, is a sense of community for us because we knew everybody at that line, at that theater, at any time, night or day, were fans like us. And we, we wouldn't be subject to ridicule or disparaging remarks because we're all there for the same thing. This amazing movie that brought us together and made us a fandom to be reckoned with, basically. <laughs> I was 12 years old when Star Wars came out in, in 1977, and I think that was the, the perfect age to see Star Wars. Even though we're dealing with lightsabers and blasters and aliens and other worlds, it looked real. And it made you think it was real because it's like, that ship is filthy. Look at the X-Wings. I mean, would you really, you know, want to fly in that? I uh, grew up in the United Kingdom. I was nine years old when um, what we now know as Episode 4, A New Hope, dropped. 
Uh, what was interesting about the UK is at that time we got all of our big movies at least six months later than uh, the US and so we had an additional six months plus of hype and marketing and so by the time the movie actually came out and I got to see it I was on the, the verge of exploding but it did change my life. Hi I'm Yazdi Patavala and um, I was about nine years old when I first, first watched Star Wars. It was at the Sterling Cinema in Mumbai in India. I remember uh, just being in awe of it and I'd gone to see watch the movie with my with my family and I think when I was that age uh, at least in India you never went and watched with your friends or your neighbors you always watched with your family and I first saw Star Wars when I was 12 years old we tried to see it at a movie theater but we were unable to because it was just sold out it was constantly sold out so my father in his wisdom packed us all up into his Grand Prix and took us to the Mission Bay drive-in. I imagine it was kind of torturous for my parents because we, the kids, we were just amped. We were so excited. People knew how to react instinctively. When Darth Vader appeared out of the steam and smoke from the blasting open that, that door, you figured he was bad and everybody was booing and hissing. Booth, you know, and, the, and, the, and that was just like, whoa, I'm not the only one that wants to make noise at this. Yahoo! I mean, how many years later? And I can still be all enthusiastic about it because I still remember how cool that was. Very cool to hear their excitement. And you can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org. Thank you for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi. Have a great evening. Major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, proud to support the mission of KPBS and privileged to serve San Diego clients. Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, helping homeowners maintain drain, heating and cooling systems since 1978. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. by viewers like you. Thank you.